Uh, let's talk is through presentation alignment in neural networks. It's from a recent TNLR publication in collaboration with uh, Wei Hu and Martha White. There's this common scenario in machine learning that you have a task with a large amount of data, the upstream task, and you use that to pre-train a large neural network like this one on the left. And then you can, when you have a new task that related to that old task uh, and has a smaller amount of data, you can use the representations obtained from that uh, pre-trained neural network to train a smaller, smaller model, like a linear model on this new task that, that's called the downstream task. The scenario is called a uh, feature transfer is common in, uh, in machine learning. And this talk will be pointing out a property of representations obtained in this way that has some uh, consequences for uh, training our models. Uh, just some notation first, uh, this, the talk is not going to be mathy, but we just need uh, some concepts. Uh, we have a representation matrix phi that's n by d. It has n rows, one for each data point, and it has d columns, one for each feature, that's the representation that we obtained from that uh, neural network. And if you do singular value decomposition or SVD on that representation matrix, on that matrix, you'll get these three matrices, uh, U, Sigma, and V. U is N by N. Uh, each column of it is called a left singular vector. V is D by D. Each column of it is called a right singular vector. And sigma looks like this. It has a diagonal matrix part at the top. Each element is a singular value that corresponds to one of your uh, singular vectors. And it's sorted from the largest to smallest. And you have a block of the zeros beneath it, assuming that you have more data points than features. Uh, you also have a label vector, uh, y that's n by one. So here we are assuming that you have a one scalar label for each data point. So you have n elements overall. And it, it's a regression problem. Or if you have a binary classification problem, you can have a plus and minus one labels depending on which class uh, the data point is in. And you have a weight vector. Now we uh that's used in your new model that you will train on this extracted representation this weight vector has the elements in it number of your features uh we will have this uh regression linear regression scenario that uh where the loss is the squared error that looks like this and again this representation itself can be done linear it's extracted from it's extracted from a neural network but the model that we will use, uh, we will train on this representation is linear. And this is the squared error. Uh, the elements of uh, Y are again real value. Then if it's a binary classification problem, you can give a plus and minus one labels. Now this, uh, this matrix U is N by N. So you have N vectors that are each N dimensional and they all have a uh, length one and they're orthogonal to each other. That forms a basis for an n-dimensional space and orthonormal basis it's called and your label vector is one vector in an n-dimensional space so you can represent that vector in that basis of n vectors and this is what we mean by y superscript u or u transpose y each element of it is just uh, the uh, the length of the projection of your label vector on one of these uh, singular vectors so if you have like y, so if y is completely in the direction of the first left singular vector, then this uh, matrix, the, this vector y u is going to, going to be like one zero 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 and so on. And by representation alignment, we roughly for now mean that the label vector is mostly in the span of the first left singular vectors. So when you obtain this matrix, in this vector y superscript u, the first elements are large and then the rest are going to be small. I'll show an uh, extreme example of it. 
compare these these two uh, problems. Both have the same representation, the, the same input, and uh, they have two different labels. Uh, each one is a two dimensional uh, problem. So your phi is a has two columns, and whatever this a number of data points has, it is going to be the number of uh, rows in phi. And they are scattered in this way. They're more elongated in one direction. And so, if you if you uh, the the labels here are represented as a as a colors. So blue here, dark blue uh, means that uh, the like negative numbers of labels, and dark red means positive number of labels. And on the left, the labels uh, vary in this direction where the data is more spread out. So they range from negative up to zero in the middle and positive numbers uh, towards the, the top. And this is what happens if you set the label vector to the first um, singular vector. On the right, the labels vary in the direction where the data is less elongated, it's uh, closer together. And you can see that the labels uh, vary in this, uh, vary from um, negative numbers uh, on the like, upper left to positive numbers on the lower right. And this is what happens if you set the label vector on the second uh, singular vector. So this, this is uh, what we mean, the, the one on the left is what we mean by representation alignment. And like this, this is an extreme example, and we'll formalize it. So, um, you, have now, you have two singular values on, uh, on these two uh, problems. The first, uh, on each of these two problems, the first singular value is larger and the second singular value is smaller. And again, on the, on the left, uh, the label vector, is in the direction of the singular vector that has the large singular value. So is this clear so far? Questions? Okay. I'll show an example of it in MNIST. Here, the representation is not from a neural network, but here, the, for this example, the representation is the original features in the data set. So in any state set, you, each data point has like 784 features, and that's what is the flattened uh, image of the digit, and that's what we mean by features here. Uh, you can obtain a, a binary classification uh, problem from MNIST by just selecting the first two classes of uh, MNIST and give a plus one and minus one labels. And so you have a representation matrix phi that um, has some data points and 784 columns. And you have a label vector y that has the yeah, same number of uh, data points and its elements are plus one and minus one depending on which class the data point belongs to. You can uh, perform singular value decomposition on this representation matrix, and you obtain a bunch of uh, singular values and uh, left singular vectors. And let's say you have uh, 10,000 data points overall. You have 10,000 uh, 10, dimensional left singular uh, vectors. And you can uh, plot the singular values and also the projection of your label vector on each of those singular vectors. Uh, on the, on the, uh, look at the plot on the left, the dashed blue curve uh, that well, really quickly uh, shows the spectrum of your singular values. So the first few ones, very few ones are pretty large and then the rest are small. It uh, uh, decreases pretty fast to numbers close to zero. The red bars are the length of the projection of your label vector on the corresponding uh, singular vectors. So these are in fact like the elements of uh, the, these uh, red bars are the elements of Y superscript U that we talked about in uh, squared representation alignment. And, and uh, they, they are squared because like we care about how large they are. Some, some can be negative, some can, some can be uh, positive. 
And like this, if you look at this spike in the red bars in the beginning, it shows uh, the property that we meant here, that uh, the first elements of uh, Y superscript U are pretty large, and then the rest are small. And so that label vector of Y is mostly in the direction of your first uh, left singular vectors. Also, these are these these are the ones that have a pretty large singular values. Uh, compare this one on the left with the plot on the right. The plot on the right, everything is the same except we shuffle the labels. So that's kind of uh, correspondence between the labels and the inputs is lost now. So it's not that like a plus one uh, represents uh, corresponds to the data point from the second class and the minus one uh, corresponds to the data point from the first class. And you can see that like this spike here is gone and you, you have lost that, that property and uh, the label vector is in some random direction in that uh, animational space. So you don't have that property anymore that uh, the label vector would be mostly in the direction of the first left singular vectors. Uh, this is some example from, uh, again, a binary classification problem from MNIST. And here we, we're not using uh, neural networks and so on. Uh, is this also clear? Because I'm about to show a plot similar to this. So, so. okay, let's see. Now, here's one example in neural networks. Um, we use a three hidden layer um, neural network uh, on the same uh, inputs, like the previous example and on the shuffled labels. And the representation here is the representation extracted from the last hidden layer. Now, before you train that hidden layer, again, the representation in that uh, last hidden layer has no relationship uh, between uh, uh, with, uh, with those uh, labels that you will use for, that you will uh, use, uh, which are uh, shuffled. So if you plot uh, the same plot, using those shuffled labels and the representation from the last hidden layer of that uh, initialized uh, neural network, you get a plot like this that has uh, no spike in the beginning and shows no correspondence between the uh, representation and the labels. But if you train this neural network on these shuffled labels, and after training, when the loss has uh, reduced, uh, your training loss has reduced a very large uh, um, number, you extract that uh, representation from that uh, trained neural network and uh, look at and look at and uh, plot the same plot with that representation and the labels that you used for training, you get the plot on the right. So even though you, your labels were in fact shuffled in the beginning and, and they didn't have the they didn't have any correspondence to the neural uh, your your input, when you trained your neural network on these labels, it has learned a representation that has this spike in the beginning and it has this property, uh, this relationship uh, with the labels that you used for uh, training this network. You can see again that the representation that uh, the network has learned has this spike and uh, um, the label vectors that you use for training uh, are mostly now in the first uh, few, in the direction of the first few singular vectors of this representation. And this is like what I mean by saying that representation alignment emerges in neural networks. So when you have some uh, training labels and you, you train a neural network on these uh, on these labels, it learns a representation even if there is no even if this property is not there in the beginning, it learns a representation that has this relationship with the, with the labels with your training labels. Is this also clear? Now we will be. Uh, comparing some representations, and then the differences are not going to be as extreme as they are before. That one had like a spike, and one was uh, completely missed that uh, spike. Uh, so we will uh, formalize this uh, alignment uh, property, and we'll plot it in a way that we can uh, compare this alignment uh, in different representations. 
Uh, this is how we formalize uh, alignment. These numbers here are, so we have a representation matrix phi and we have some labels Y and we want to uh, measure this uh, relationship between that representation matrix and those uh, labels, that vector of labels. And these uh, numbers here are like those uh, red bars that you had in the previous uh, plus. They're the uh, they're those elements of uh, y per script u. So if the uh, the first ones are large, then you would have that uh, alignment property that you wanted. And we also include some uh, threshold on the singular values. Uh, each one of these uh, singular values correspond to one of those uh, singular vectors. So the first ones are the large singular values and they correspond to those first uh, singular vectors. And for each of these uh, thresholds, we obtain some value that's uh, the sum of those uh, uh, elements squared that have uh, singular values larger than that thresh threshold. So if this number is large for a large threshold, then it means that you have uh, your uh, label vector has large projection on those first few singular vectors. This is clear. And so we can uh, vary the threshold from a small number to a very large number and plot that uh, this uh, sum for uh, each one of those thresholds and we get a curve across the different thresholds. So for example, uh, this one, like the green one is uh, that it just like labeled good means that like your label vector was mostly in those first few directions of those uh, singular, singular vectors. Why? Because even when you, make the threshold high, you can still have a, a large uh, magnitude of projections that correspond to uh, those uh, singular values that have uh, values larger than that threshold. And the red one is pretty bad because like it's the, the projections are mostly in those later directions that have uh, small singular values. So once you raise this threshold a bit, it uh, drops down and you don't have projections larger than those values. This is good. And oh, one side point that we will compare different thresholds and so one, simple implication of this, it would be that if you just scale your representation by a large number, then all of your singular values will become large and then you'll get a, a larger curve. But we, 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 don't, we want to take that into account and we want to normalize by that in, uh, when we want to compare different representations. So we will re normalize representations uh, by normalizing each data point to have a length one uh, in the representation when we want to compare two representations. So like this is a common uh, pre-processing model if you want to extract representations from a neural network and train a new model on it. So this is the uh, main result I wanted to show you this talk. Um, we have um, we have a risk net uh, with uh, 101 layers that's uh, pre-trained on ImageNet. And we extract representations on that uh, to uh, do binary classification on uh, two, between two models of uh, CFAR 10. So uh, this is, probably the most uh, common example of uh, feature transfer uh, vision at least. Uh, so on the left, we compare uh, a pre-trained uh, ResNet and uh, ResNet at initialization, and also the representations that obtained by just flattening the images uh itself so it's you know, like your input features in the data set without any um neural network included um 
is like a uh, transfer here means uh, when we have that uh, pre-trained ResNet and extract the representation on CFAR10, on two classes of CFAR10 from that. And we compute the alignment between this uh, representation, this obtained representation, and the labels of like those data points in CFAR10. So ImageNet is only involved in pre-training the, the, that uh, ResNet. And here, like the alignment curve is about those two classes of CFAR10. We extract a representation from that uh, pre-trained uh, neural network, uh, the last hidden layer of it, and we look at the we compute the alignment curve as we had before between that uh, representation matrix and the labels of those data points. Uh, again, we have minus one and plus one labels for this uh, binary classification problem, and we get a pretty like a high. Uh, alignment care that uh, stays high for a very large threshold and uh, falls down in this uh, kind of a later threshold. Compare this to this uh, ori compare this to like original and in its uh, cares. Original means if we don't have any neural networks involved and we just use you just flatten the images themselves as the representation matrix. So the label vector is the same as before, but the features instead of being uh, obtained from that pre-trained neural network are just flattened images. And you get a low, a lower relative to this uh, alignment uh, care of that, like it's lower across all the uh, threshold, threshold. And in it is when you extract the representation from a, from the same neural network, but as at, at initialization without any pre-training, and you get like the lowest uh, care here in the beginning. On the right, we have um, uh, the green curve is like the same as transfer. The difference here between just uh, these two green curves is it's just here that uh, the, for the one and the Right, we just uh, ran the experiment uh, five times and averaged uh, these curves. So you have like these uh, error bars that represent standard errors. Um, the red, the green curve is uh, obtained in a similar way as this one. So again, you have pre-trained the neural network on ImageNet. You extract the that representation on some images from a binary classification uh, task from CFAR10. And you plot that alignment curve between that extracted representations and those uh, plus one and minus one labels. And we um, we can compare this with uh, three uh, handcrafted features that were previously popular before, the, uh, mostly before this uh, uh, deep neural networks. This is like histogram of gradients, this is SIP features. And, this is also an RBF feature that not really a vision feature, it's just uh, some machine learning way of constructing features. And these three are these three representations are not uh, not obtained from uh, neural networks. And you can see that like uh, in terms of like this alignment curve, this the representation obtained from neural network uh, remains higher than all these uh, three features across all these thresholds. So it's like interesting that uh, this one uh, RBF features can perfectly uh, fit your training data. They are high dimensional enough that can perfectly fit your training data, but they are still like they are still much worse than uh, like uh, ResNet or one hundred one in this in terms of like this uh, alignment. Oh, so in this case, you didn't train on CFAR10 at all. You just right. so if we did train on CFAR10, would the curve be even higher for the transfer? I think so. I didn't try it, but like based on other experiments, similar experiments, I would expect that. So. Yeah. Okay. So why should this matter? And like, why should mm, it's like a high alignment at some threshold matter? And why would we want to use this kind of measure in our Analysis. Uh, let's look at these uh, two examples we had uh, in the beginning. That like these two extreme examples of uh, uh, high and low alignment. You would uh, say that 
So for again, like if you look at the pictures on the top, you had these uh, two problems. The representation was the same in those two problems, but the label vector was different. And uh, on the left, you had that the label vector uh, was in the direction of the first uh, singular vector, the one that had a larger singular value. And on the right, you had that the label vector was in the direction of the second singular vector, the one that had smaller singular value. And this is like the one on the left was what we meant by high alignment because it was in the direction of the first uh, singular, uh, singular vector. Uh, if you look at the optimization surfaces of uh, a linear model that would be trained on these two problems, this, uh, this is how they would look. Uh, the, well, the red, you have like, of course, a two dimensional uh, optimization problem for this uh, two dimensional uh, example, and you don't have any bias in it. Uh, either red dots are your minimizer. Um, in both of these cases, you have two directions in your optimization landscape. One is more steep and that uh, like the steepness of that uh, corresponds to your larger singular uh, value. And one direction is more gentle and flat and its uh, steepness corresponds to your smaller singular value. If you, but uh, the, the blue arrow shows the trajectory that you would have uh, from a zero initialize, from zero initialize, initialization of weights uh, towards your optimizer. And as you can see that if your problem is like the one on the left, your trajectory will be completely in the direction of that, in the direction of that, uh, in the fast direction, the one that is corresponds to your larger singular value. And for the problem on the right, your trajectory is completely going to be uh, on the direction of the, on the more uh, gentle and flat direction. And so if you have like the same step size here, then like you would get pretty fast optimization with gradient descent uh, on this problem on the left and you'd have uh, slow optimization for the problem on the right. Okay. Now a more formal and more general uh, expression of what I just said is this, uh, proposition here. Uh, this is not a groundbreaking result. This is about uh, a linear model trained with full batch gradient descent, which is on like square there, which is like a basic setting. And if you've worked on optimization theory, you might have already noticed it or worked with it. But I just want to present this as a kind of proof of concept that taking this uh, relationship between the label vector and the singular vectors of your uh, representation matrix uh, has like clear implications for your theory and the training of uh, your, your models. So the proposition goes to this and that under some assumptions that we will not uh, get into, if alignment uh, phi y tau is uh, equal to delta, this is how we define, this is the alignment that we defined before uh, for some uh, threshold, then gradient descent needs at most this number of iterations to reduce the loss by 0.9 delta. This uh, 0.9 is some arbitrary number. If you change it, you just get some different constant factor here that get hidden in that big O notation. So that 0.9 is really not important to get that 0.99 here. But what it generally means is that if your alignment is high for a large threshold, then you can reduce a high amount of loss with a pretty fast uh, rate that depends on that threshold. So this, uh, this uh, threshold here appears in the uh, denominator here, and if it's large, then you need fewer iterations. So your optimization with that same step size is going to be fast. And so, yeah, but this is the main takeaway message from this, uh, from, from this uh, result. This is clear. So I said it's a basic, result, but it, it might still be confusing uh, if you have questions or if something is unclear. 
Okay. Okay. So we'll head to some example to illustrate this, this result. You have two problems, the red problem, let's call it, and the blue problem. Uh, both of them are have the same representation, but the label vector is uh, different. The representation is, is obtained actually from some regression data set from uh, UCI. And the label vector is some real valued uh, vectors that we set manually to create these kinds of uh, alignment curves on, on the left. This is how the alignment curves uh, look like for the two label vectors. For the blue one, um, you have like a, a, well, you have the alignment curve dropping a bit here and then by a large amount later with a uh, larger threshold. It means that the label vector has uh, some small components in that uh, direction with a, with a smaller singular uh, value and a large component with that direction with a large singular value. So once your threshold passes that small singular value, then your alignment curve drops a bit. And once your threshold passes that very large uh, value, then your align uh, alignment curve drops completely. And the red curve is something in between. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's completely in a uh, direction of a singular vector with an intermediate uh, singular value. If you train a full mesh gradient descent linear model on square there with uh, that representation and these two different labels, you get these two interesting uh, curves. Um, now, I, I, as you can see, like the blue curve has a pretty fast rate in the beginning and a slower uh, rate than the red curve in, to, towards the end. Why is it so? Because it had some large element with that uh, in the direction with, with a very large singular value. And if you look back to the proposition we had before, it means that the loss that corresponds to uh, that, well, that part of the loss will be reduced with a very uh, fast rate. And like this early phase of the training where uh, training with the blue curve is faster corresponds to that. Now it's then it has a small amount of uh, label vector in a direction with a very small uh, singular value. And the later slow phase of optimization corresponds to that part of the loss, which will be reduced at a very slow rate. Um, the red curve is uh, fully, the uh, label vector for this uh, red alignment curve is fully in the direction with some inter intermediate uh, singular value. So it's going, to be, it's going to have some intermediate convergence rate uh, throughout the optimization. And here like that uh, full um, picture of the alignment curve through these different thresholds can uh, show this, uh, can describe the behavior of the optimization of this uh, simple model uh, through the training. If you had used uh, some like textbook classic convergence analysis, then you, like, your, your optimization would probably just depend on that uh, your smallest singular vector, so singular value and your largest singular value. And it would not depend on the, on the, a label vector and you would get some kind of worst case analysis, some worst case bounds that would be the same for these uh, two different label vectors. But if you take this label vector and its relationship to the uh, uh, different singular vectors of the representation into account, you can perfectly describe these different uh, behaviors of these two curves in the beginning of the initial training and towards the end of the training. So is this also clear? This is a kind of a demonstration of the uh, previous proposition. Um, 
So we have uh, more uh, results on uh, representations uh, in synthetic transfer tasks and more realistic transfer tasks with uh, negative transfer, positive transfer, feature transfer, and fine tuning on. And it's like the end of the paper if you want to see. And we have uh, more results that uh, this representation alignment property emerges in neural networks with different uh, number of layers, different width of layers, different activations and different batch sizes and so on. But uh, this, I wanted to like present these uh, few results to just uh, explain uh, what alignment is and what we mean when we say like alignment emerges in neural networks and new representations extracted from neural networks have high alignment on these uh, related tasks. And why alignment would matter uh, by providing this uh, kind of uh, basic result to that to explain that this relationship between the label vector and your representations matters to optimization of that uh, simple model. And you can then look at this in your own experience in your uh, in your own in your own theoretical work or in your own application uh, work by extracting those representations that you get from these neural networks doing singular value decomposition and uh, comparing, uh, looking at the projections of your label vector to this, uh, to on these uh, singular vectors. And so, yeah, the main, Takeaway take message here is that if you have neural networks trained on a related task and the representation, ex you extract from it uh, and you would hope that it uh, transfer well. Uh, you can expect it to have this relationship between to your with your new labels, that the label vector is mostly in the direction of your uh, first singular ve vectors, the ones that have large singular values. And this can help you restrict you the set of problems you want to study. If this is if these uh, representations are what you care about in, in, in your problem, uh, you can use this in your theoretical work as a kind of assumption because typically in theory uh, you very often face the situation that you well you have some theoretical upper bound that has nothing to do with what actually happens. And you want to improve it, but you also have a worst case lower bound that says, well, you can't do much better than this case. So you have uh, some wide mismatch between your theory and your what, what happens in practice. And well, if you want to improve it, you'll need some assumptions that restrict the class of problems that you will care about, that you will analyze. And you can uh, use this property and somehow formalize it on, in your theoretical work to limit the to limit uh, your theory to the class of problems that you'll be interested in, and then you can hopefully get a better bounds. Like for example, that uh, simple proposition that showed uh, faster optimization rates. And similarly, if you want to design new algorithms, you have this kind of no free lunch principle that. If you have an algorithm that works better than the, your some competitor in some on some problem, it's going to work worse on that competitor in some other problems. So you don't want. So you you probably don't want to aim to in design some algorithm that works best on any conceivable problem. You want to work. You want to design an algorithm that works. Based on the set on the set of problems that you will be interested in, and if the set of problems you will be interested in have representations that come from neural networks, then you can uh, say that okay, I want to design an algorithm that works well on representations that that have this property and this kind of relationship between the representation and the labels, and I provided a. a uh, definition of representation alignment here, like a kind of a formal and rigorous definition of representation alignment here that uses threshold and the sum of uh, uh, projections larger than th that threshold. But in your problem, depending on your theoretical work or the, the algorithm that you want to design, 
you might want to formalize it differently. And I just want to leave you with this uh, broad idea that if you have a neural network trained on a similar test, you can expect that representation to have this kind of relationship to the label that the label vector is, is in those first few directions. Whether you want to formalize that idea in this way that I described or some other way, uh, you're free to do it, whatever that uh, matches your uh, problems and your uh, contributions better. But you have to, of course, uh, verify the new formaliza uh, formalization there. And that's it for the talk. If you have questions, please do ask. So is your conclusion um, is independent of the optimizer you use, whether it's S3D or Adam or what server to learn the representation? Right. So this result and also this idea about optimization is exactly for, uh, this is for gradient descent. And I have seen the same kind of result. I mean, of course, not exactly in this way, but the same relative performance with like SGD and also Adam. It does not, but it does not hold at all if you have a true uh, second order method. So the Newton method, I guess. If you have that kind of method, then optimization is going to be the same for both of these because that evens out these differences completely. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is it possible to realign the middle training? Middle training. Uh, is it possible to realign? Yeah. In the middle of the training? Yeah. Uh, you mean like in the middle of the training of the neural network or the new model, like that linear model, for example? Uh, sure. uh, this is an online question from Yoga. So you can open up the chat. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you can make it. Okay. Uh, maybe if I just uh, say it, can you hear me uh, there? Okay, yeah. Um, so if you have a representation and if you have uh, some labels, you can, of course, also change that representation to improve that uh, alignment between the representation and the labels. If you look up uh, something called a kernel target alignment, then that's uh, something that is not exactly formulated in this way, but it's some measure of some kind of relationship between some representation or kernel as they consider it, uh, and the labels. And you can perfectly use that measure as a kind of objective and maximize it uh, train your up, train your uh, parameterized representation to maximize it, and that is going to also increase the alignment between the representation and those uh, labels in the way we discussed. So I guess the keyword there is kernel target alignment. So I have a question. Uh, you say so. The conclusion is that you you consider the uh, representation alignment uh, uh, into account, then you can expand a set of problems. But like with, um, do the uh, representation alignment, you have to train all the tasks, or 
you can without training can find the whether the alignment is this or not. Um so like a representation alignment basically is, I mean, like the idea of representation alignment I'm like describing here uh, is not like restricted to neural networks. You have some representation on some targets that can be obtained in any way and they might, they have like some level of alignments depending on your the representation and target and the th threshold you 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 set. But uh, uh, the, the point here was that if you have a neural uh, representation that's obtained from a neural network pre-trained on a similar task, you expect you would expect this to have like that high level of uh, alignment through these uh, thresholds. Uh, but what what I've generally seen is that in many real world tasks as well, even even the input representation, the in the the original representations in in the, in the features have already pretty uh, high alignment. So that MNIST example was one that I described, and like in that fir very first example we had. So this first example was uh, MNIST, and here the representation was not from a neural network. It was like a flattened MNIST images, and you had this uh, property on the left. And I've seen this in many other um, data sets as well. Did you evaluate your uh, uh, this uh, representation to different data sets other than um, like uh, like uh, to uh, just uh, to check how big uh, the games in different data sets like um, playing networks? Right. So yes, I mean without the neural networks, just from the representation of the data set, right? Uh, no, like um, uh, using this representation alignment. Uh, for different pre-trained networks with different data sets. Um, yeah, I mean, yes, like we have some results. I can't really give a, like a confident conclusion of like comparing different networks right now. We have like some results and like different plots of different uh, networks and different uh, data sets in like that uh, TMLR paper. Here you can like check them out, but I can't really give a confident conclusion of a, a comparison between them right now. <laughs> 